or this was quite a project. I, I want to ask you a question. So, um, did you do the voiceover at the end? Yeah. I just met you and I thought, that's his voice. <laughs> that sounded good. Like, yeah. I was impressed with that. <laughs> So it's funny because when I did the voiceover the week before, I actually got a pallet spreader in my mouth. And I got bra I got braces on, so uh, it sounds a little lispy. But it sounded uh, like you still. I thought it was good. Well, I made it, so I know the nuances that I wish I could change. Oh, but, uh, well, we we liked it, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. So this is such an amazing film, and it. I've been able to talk to you, and I love this film anyway, but tell us how you got roped into this and about Darren Bond and how you came to be part of this project. Uh, so um, I got a phone call from uh, a filmmaker friend who said that there's a guy putting on a festival that wanted to do uh, a small documentary about um, kind of what he's approaching. So uh, he gave me the address and I go out to Darren's property and I was kind of like, <laughs> what is this place? Like, this is kind of weird. So I sit down and I talk to Darren for about four hours about aliens, because <laughs> this is Darren Bond. And uh, he said, uh, I was like, yeah, so you need me to film this thing? And he goes, yeah, here's the flyer. And I, I look at it and uh, he said, I, I looked at it and it said, Zed's dead. And I said, wow, you booked Zed's dead. And he goes, yeah, are they any good? I was like, yeah, they're pretty good. They headlined some of the biggest EDM festivals in the world. Um, the guy had no idea who he had booked, essentially. Right, right. <laughs> so, he just paid for it and said, come on over. So I was like, cool, this guy's going to put on a festival and totally bomb it. And I'm going to record it and sell it to Netflix. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen, obviously. <laughs> it went a different direction, right, yeah. than what you guys thought it was going to go. And it ended up being very touching. Yeah. Did you love the little dog biscuit? When the wife starts, Linda, right? Yeah, Linda, yeah. When she starts speaking, I'm like, now we're getting the real story. Okay. And yeah, she starts telling us really, because you just see him and he's the most tenacious human like on the planet. It goes and goes. Yeah, Darren's an interesting character, as you can see. I mean, he built all that really weird stuff. <laughs> so um, Darren has a zeal and passion for life uh, that I haven't seen with a lot of people. And uh, we, we essentially wanted to just document what was happening. This wasn't supposed to be a film, so you saw a lot of repeat shots in there. So we didn't shoot that much. We weren't planning on doing a full feature-length documentary. But once I interviewed his wife and I found out kind of what the guy wanted to do, I was like, there's a story in this. So I went up to Darren and I said, give me all your money, I'm gonna go tell a story about you. <laughs> and he did, so. <laughs> and he's right now at another film festival talking yeah. about the film too, so yeah. divide and conquer. Do you guys have questions for Jason about this film? Who wants to go see this land and this house? I'm like, can we go, look at this. We all wanna go have a little party at Darren's house. <laughs> Darren would probably love that. Actually. He would be like, come on out, yeah. yeah. So he... Congratulations, Jason, on a beautiful and inspiring film. Oh, thanks. It really was. I have so many questions about the music, and, and I want to know your decision process about what seemed to me the choice to not use any live music you know, during the festival footage, right, sound. So there's very little crowd sound, almost none. There seemed to be some pyro sounds at the end. But, but were you, you were playing the actual songs that were playing at the moment of the film? Or what were your decisions around that? And did it have something to do with you know, not having gone in originally thinking you were gonna do a full length documentary? Talk about that. So this is my first feature length film. And yeah. I knew we were going to try and take it to distribution and post. So all of the music that you heard and all of the sound effects that you heard were actually not in the festival. So I took the film to Northern California to a friend of mine, uh, J.M. Freidenmacher, and he has this huge sound library and he put all of those sounds. All the... I know we've talked about rock trucks a lot, but I can't express to you how many rocks <laughs> were at this festival. <laughs> it was just an army of rock trucks and so all of the noises were actually imported. We didn't have uh, sound outside of the logs that we had on Darren. So um, 
my camera, it was, it was really difficult because my camera guys kept coming back and they were carrying, you know, $80,000 cameras to go record this thing. And uh, they were like, man, my camera's getting trashed. So there was this healthy balance of what we could get, what we could not get. And uh, the last thing you want to do is spend $80,000 of your budget into some dude's camera. <laughs> so um, every uh, when we went into post, I learned, so all those graphics that you saw on the screens on the stage are actually copyrighted. So I had to get, I had to pay to get a release to show any of the good shots that I got at the end. The music that I chose, um, I actually went through a music supervisor and she, phenomenal, Rosie Howe, she now works at Netflix. Um, great, great human being, but um, I hired her and then I, I love music, so, um, and I know people say that all the time, but I'm absolutely infatuated with noise. So, uh, I, I picked all the songs, but it was really, most of the songs that I picked for the film I couldn't afford, uh, because I like expensive music, apparently. And, uh, so you would go and you'd, you'd pay to, to, to buy a song, and some of the songs were about $30,000, just for one song. And I could only use it for maybe 30 seconds. So, I mean, that, that was one of the hurdles that I had to get through, but... Um, it went to going on Spotify and finding indie artists that I could work with that weren't going to charge me an arm and a leg uh, to actually put music in there. So uh, it was a lot of, I think a third of my post-production was me actually just listening to music on Spotify. So none of it was EDM? Some of it, so uh, EDM people are really touchy about if you call their grime dubstep EDM. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but that's what they're calling it. Um, so uh, they, it's dance music, essentially, most of it. Uh, some of it's dubstep, some of it's uh, words I can't pronounce, but um, we actually approached some of the artists, and that was actually more difficult than actually going on Spotify, because these guys were trying to make it, and everybody needs money for the thing they put money into to make so as an artist I understood that but fortunately you have bumpers and budgets that you have to stay in so but I knew I was doing a festival uh, uh, a documentary about a festival so I needed to make sure that I had music that kind of moved people and, and you know despite whether they listen to EDM because if I had EDM throughout this whole project you'd probably never listen to EDM after today. <laughs> yeah, so uh, music was actually really difficult because I was like, do I go with something kind of dancey or do I actually go into something a little softer for softer parts, but yeah. You have other questions for Jason? Was, was there anything in the film, um, especially kind of, you know, with the way that you had to film it, you know, and everything was just kind of, you know, just kind of was taking place and you were just trying your best to document it. Was there anything that uh, didn't maybe come out quite the way, like like it didn't, it wasn't conveyed in quite the way that you wanted to be, or you know, just because of circumstance or, or whatnot, you know, with the film? All of it. All of it. <laughs> Almost all of it, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, uh, so here's a funny story. So Zed's Dead is huge band, right? Canada is one of the biggest artists. So all throughout the festival, I'm hammering one of the guys in the film, Sam, I'm saying, I need to get on stage to shoot with Zed's dead. And they're like, no, we can't do that. And I'm like, cool, I need you to do that regardless of how you feel about it. <laughs> so all through the festival. So up until about 30 minutes before they actually went on stage, it was a hard no. Was it because of the rain and the equipment? Or... So like the, licensing, like why didn't they want to? Licensing, contracts, okay. all this, because it's yeah. not just the artist. You have to go through right. the managers and their label yeah. and all that stuff. Um, so, I mean, we finally got to go from their manager, but we got a verbal yes. So we got on stage and shot some cool stuff. We well, had a drone guy that came out, and then I had to call him off because they kept saying no. And then when he got too far out, he wouldn't come back. So I got no drone shots of the overheads of this big because they had to save all the pyro for only Zed's dead because the fire marshals, they can't shoot any. So there was $175,000 worth of pyro they were shooting off in 45 minutes. And I was like, I want a drone shot of that. Yeah. And I didn't get it. Oh. 
But that's the cruel nature of documentaries, is you shoot everything you think you need, and at the end, hopefully, you get it, and then you write the script. Yeah. And so I shot for a short film and didn't get almost everything I needed, and then went into post, and everybody was like, I want a bajillion dollars for my song. And then so when I went into post, even to get the license to get Zed's Dead's images, which were our best in the film, I had to go through their label rep and their manager and their cousin and their grandma. And it was just like, it, it, it was crazy. It, I, I learned a lot about music and I will never be in that industry ever again. <laughs> Thank you so much. You guys can mingle and talk with him. You'll be here the rest of the day yeah. around, hopefully. I think somebody else. Oh, did you have another question? Did I miss someone? Oh, yeah, go. Sorry, can you say that one more time? <laughs> First of where you started and wanting to film a documentary of how this Indian Pacific Festival got started and all the big other struggles and obstacles in the way and how you were breaking it up or if that's the intention from the beginning and just, just seeing it through and seeing all of the... Yeah, so happy. Um, so I'm an old emo kid, right? Uh, so I'm never happy, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Darren's infatuated with the film, uh, which was kind of who the only person you need to make happy is the financier, right? Uh, I, I love it for what I was able to convey with it because I essentially went out to go cover an EDM festival. And I don't go to festivals uh, because the Warped Tour ended 10 years ago. But uh, <laughs> I go to this thing, and the idea was to, to basically do a documentary about um, the culture of an EDM festival, what that looked like. That was the approach, right? Oh, okay. And so we go in there and all hell breaks loose, which is funny because I specialize in dis disaster documentaries. That's what I'm known for. Um, so thank God he gave me a disaster so I could tell a story. Uh, uh, but so if I ever tell a story about your life, be worried. Uh, but the approach was, was vastly different than what I actually ended up with. And a lot of that came after I interviewed Darren's wife, because I was asking him, I said, hey, Darren, uh, why are you doing this? And he said, you know, the, the course of human history and yada, yada, yada. And I was like, cool, I'm going to go ask your wife. Yeah. So I interviewed his wife, and she told me everything. Yeah. And th at that moment, I was like, okay, Darren, you have a very endearing story. And he said, what do you mean? I was like, I watched a little farmer walk into a storm calmly to take care of other people when he didn't have to and all of his money was on the line I said there's something very endearing about that and I think we get as humans very complicated and political about what we should and should not be doing and, and, and think life is complicated but there are some decisions that just feel right and Darren made a lot of those decisions and I didn't know the story I was telling at the time was going to radiate anything about a pandemic and political division and what's happening what's happening in Ukraine and I didn't know it was going to be a way to navigate through all those things but it was and so I'm happy because of that uh, I enjoy that I was able to tell something that people can probably look at and feel better about everything that's been going on feel like they have a little bit of their power back uh, because they have an understanding of the control that they have over themselves so Yes, it did start as something this and then it turned into that, so I'm happy for that. But the overall film, I'm just, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of an artist, so I'm never happy about anything I create. Uh, but we sold it, we just sold the film, so it'll be moving to. Uh, Yay! Yay! I'm happy for that. Yeah. Uh, but there's always things I wish I could change, you know, like, there's always things. Hindsight is 2020. Yeah. Well, we haven't seen it a million times like you. So we just got to enjoy it. Yeah, I, <laughs> uh, I'm probably gonna go cut it again or something. <laughs> in your spare time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we're gonna start the next block here in just a minute, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you.